So it's not really, this is not really a geophysics lecture. It's a, it's a lecture on inverse theory and the probabilistic or Bayesian approach to the inverse problem. So <clears throat> what I'm going to present today is equally valid if you work in geochemistry, contaminant transport, uh, heating systems of uh, whatever, houses or whatever. Uh, it's not specific to geophysics. There will be a few examples specific to geophysics, but the, um, the theory is just general, okay? So, uh, inversion, we will talk a little bit about what inversion is, but uh, the Bayesian approach in many ways is the, I mean, the, yeah, maybe you shouldn't call it the complete solution here because you think about other things here, but um, the, 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 it's, 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 um, it's the most general formulation if you, exceed, if you, if you make abstraction from some formulation made by, for example, about Tarantola. It's a very general formulation of how you combine what you know with observations in order to say something about parameters that you're interested in. And you're going to do this in a probabilistic framework, so you're not going to say this is the true value, but what you're going to see is you have a distribution of possible values, and this is going to be sort of multivariate uh, distributions because we're going to work in, in higher dimensions. We're going to limit ourselves here to finite dimensional problems, so we will have uh, a number of unknowns that we will assume that is fixed, and that is of finite size. So we might have 100 unknowns, 1,000 unknowns, one unknown, but uh, there are general cases for what's called infinite dimensional inversion and uh, a reversible jump or trans-dimensional inversion where the unknowns is an unknown, so you account for this. But in this lecture, we will not treat this. Um, then Bayesian approach is basically what you need to do if you want to have a general approach when you face nonlinear problems. Okay, so we're going to talk about what that is, nonlinear problem. Then we're going to talk about how can we handle uh, more complex spatial priors describing, for example, geology. And then how can we deal with the fact that, for example, our modeling is imperfect. And if you go to geophysics, our links between physical properties and properties of interest are not perfect. And finally, for those of you that, that will think that what we will put here in the geological priors of very strong assumptions, I'm going to talk about Bayesian model selection, which is a way to compare different conceptual models that are encapsulated in, the, um, in these complex geological priors. Okay? So, uh, most problems that are of interest and most problems that you work on are nonlinear problems. Okay? Nonlinear here basically means that the topology of your domain. So the, the concentration field here that will determine some reaction rate or the drainage here uh, that is described here cannot be described by a, just a linear relation between your uh, some variable and your observed data. Basically, it's the connectivity and other values around that will influence the physics. Basically, that's it. Uh, we're going to show some example of this in a, in a bit, okay? So, we're going to say that we have a model vector, we call this M. So, we have M unknowns. These are all the parameters that they might be correlated and so on, but these are the things we want to say something about. In a very simple case, it could be a 2D permeability field that we discretize very finely. So, we have maybe 10,000 unknowns here. It could be parameters in uh, some sort of decomposition, wavelet coefficients, uh, parameters of the carbon and liver transform. Uh, it could be values of g g different geological units. It's just some parameters that if you put some values, you can map them into a geological, hydrogeological, geophysical model. And then you have the data, that's another vector. All your measurements, maybe some tracer concentrations, maybe some apparent resistivities, maybe some waveforms, uh, time series, whatever, everything you've been observing, we put it in D. So we're going to have this M is what we're interested in, it's high dimensional, D is what we measure, it's high dimensional, and then we have a link between the two, that's the forward problem. So if I solve a problem, I'm going to put some values, so I'm, draw, I'm running here, you know, a model describing uh, groundwater flow, for example, at a given location, I'm using some of those solvers that you're learning about in the, in, the, in the workshop, and you're gonna be able to predict some data. And now we're gonna predict or compare our simulated data with observed data, and we're gonna use those differences between observed and simulated to try to say which 
are the values in M here that are the most likely. Okay? Uh, so all the modeling, all the simulations that we normally do, all of that goes in the forward model. So if you do inversion, it doesn't mean that you can forget about being good on doing numerical simulations. So basically, a uh, forward problem or simulation problem, you have some known parameters, you calculate the response, so state variables typically, some concentrations, some drawdowns or something similar. The inverse problem, you have the data and you try to say something about the underlying model parameters. Okay? Uh, linear problem, you can write this as a um, uh, matrix vector multiplication, so you have a linear problem. If I change one model parameter, I change model parameter 15 from 1 to 2, my change in the data would be the same as I changed it. It will be double if I change that parameter from 1 to 3, it will double, and it will be a given value regardless of the values of the other parameters in my vector. That's not the case in, in most uh, systems that we're interested in. So here you have a nonlinear relation. So basically your operator here will depend on the actual value of your parameter field. So this you would just think about, you know, uh, unsaturated flow, for example, as an example. Okay. Now uh, we had electrical conductivity as an example today. Uh, so if you have a more or less homogeneous model, current flow will follow a well-known path. If you now have an upper layer that is more conducting than the lower one, most of the current, most of the current density will occur in this location. So my data that I will measure, if I have a pixel here and I change this from 1 to 2, where I take this pixel from 1 to 2, I do not have the same sensitivity. I do not have the same response. So it's a nonlinear problem. The, 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 the actual Physics, the flow, current densities, where the concentration is and so on, does not just depend on one individual value. If you take gravity, if I change the, the density of a given object in my gravity model, I don't care about all the other gravity, uh, all the other objects with a given mass or density. Okay? So, we need to talk about um, probability density functions. Here we start with the simplest one. This is for one uh, model variable, one difference, one uh, description of uh, measurement errors. So x here could, for example, be the measurement error. Uh, and basically, it's your classical Gaussian bell-shaped type of model. You have a mean value, x0. You have a standard deviation, sigma. And a probability density function, they will all integrate to 1. So this would be for one value. There are more general formulations, there are many of them. Uh, the most common ones, I guess, is sort of the symmetric exponential, or the sort of uh, Laplace type of distribution. So basically, in the Laplace distribution, you have uh, heavier tails. So if you have noisy data, for example, you often prefer those than a Gaussian model that gives very little probability to something that is away. Then you have the infinity uh, description, or the boxcar function, which is the most extreme, I guess where you essentially say that there's no probability to be here and there's equal to be probability any place here within this given uh, area. Then you have everything in between and then of course you have distributions where you have uh, you know, skewness, kurtosis and, and other things. So your, we will mainly look on the Gaussian case in this lecture but the theory that we're going to present is general so we can use any sort of uh, probability function. So, we have to know something now about joint probability density uh, because we're going to have parameters that are going to be correlated and we're going to combine what we know with what we are interested in uh, and the measurements. So let's just take something very simple. We have two variables, weight and height. This is the joint probability density function. If they are independent, the joint probability is just given by uh, the um, marginal probability of weight times the marginal probability of height. Now, if someone is 250, so a basketball player in the US, uh, he's 250 meter tall, he's probably going to be a bit more heavy than someone that's 170, right? So th you expect things to be correlated. So if things are correlated, um, it basically means this, that if height is high, well, then also weight is likely to be high, even if there's, of course, some scatter around those things. And measurement errors, uh, spatial variations in permeability or whatever are all likely to show some sort of correlation. 
So how can we now describe this joint probability of weight and height? Uh, we do this with a conditional PDF. Conditional PDF is essentially the marginal, so what is the probability of height that you think you would expect without considering the height? And then what is this distribution of weight given a certain height? Uh, and then you can, if you want to get now the probability of, of the height, you essentially integrate out the weight variable. Okay? So this is just a general sort of uh, law underlying uh, most statistics. You can write this joint probability now in two ways. Rho W times the conditional, Rho H times the conditional. And you can write now by just doing this, uh, Rho weight given H as this relation. Okay? And this is going to be the basis now for uh, Bayes' theorem and what we're going to do in the following. It's just that we're going to go to higher dimensions. As I said, Tarantula and Vallette in 82, they described a more general framework for inversion. Uh, basically, there are two di big differences here. They do not like this assumption of conditional probabilities because it's basically, yeah, it's a bit complicated to, to, to get into the details, but especially if you're in a very nonlinear problem. And they also do not like to say that something is the unknown and some, some, something is the measurement. So they essentially make a treatment here where you symmetrically treat both the model parameters and the data. So very beautiful theory, really worthwhile to read. Uh, but even the people that are following the Tarantola uh, approach, they often end up doing essentially normal Bayesian inversion. It's very well defined, this framework, when you have uncertain theory. So that's something they accounted for. So if your theoretical modeling is uncertain, they have a very general way for accounting for this uncertainty. So now, we go back to our model parameters and our data. So what we are targeting here is our posterior probability density function. That's given our assumption, it's everything we know about the model parameters given the data, and it's given by everything we know before we gather the data, that's your prior on M, times uh, the likelihood function. The likelihood function is a measure essentially of of, of data fit. So if there's a good agreement between the observed data and your simulated data, your likelihood is high. Uh, so this is, a, this is somehow similar to cost function in a normal optimization. And then you have a normalization here called the evidence or the marginal probability. We're going to come back to this a bit later when we talk about model selection. But at the moment, we will just say that this is a constant. And it is a constant for the case we are considering where the number of unknowns is a constant. Otherwise, we have to consider this. So normally, we write Bayes' theorem like this. Uh, so we have a proportionality here. What do we know before? And what is the information content in the data? And we want to combine them in some way. That's our problem. How do we define a prior? The most difficult problem. It's not a problem that is only valid for the uh, probabilistic approach. So people. You know, there's this sort of Bayesianists and frequentists, and they say, oh, you shouldn't assume anything, you should just let the data speak for themselves. What you would then normally do is that you will try to reduce the number of unknowns so much that you're actually solving for a system that is not necessarily very, um, could be at least not very useful. So in any inversion, you're making assumptions, you're discretizing your problem in terms of different parameters, and you assign some likelihood of different type of models. This is what we do with n inversion. It's just in the Bayesian inversion, there's a really an explicit step in really defining what you think you can assume beforehand. Um, Tarantola, if you read him, if you don't have spatial fields, it's rather easy to say, I want to be conservative. If I work with physical constants, so permeability, conductivity, uh, and so on, typically you use Sorry, it should be Jeffrey's priors, not the Jeffrey priors, but Jeffrey's priors. So that's a log uniform prior. So you assume that the logarithm has a uniform distribution. Of course, what we often do in groundwater is to assume a multivariate Gaussian prior. And those look like this. You have all seen those. Uh, so here is the same prior for the Gaussian model. It's just generalized when you have now many dimensions. So M is maybe whatever, 10,000 dimensions, and you have some correlation, some spatial correlation, and that spatial correlation is given by a variogram model, classical geostatistics, and it's encapsulated here in the model covariance matrix. 
Then you have a prior model that is essentially what you expect your mean model to be. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. The likelihood, I hope you can see it here, so the likelihood if you assume that errors are Gaussian, so there's a Gaussian distribution of your errors, you have exactly the same form. It's just that m and m prior here is your prediction of your forward model compared with the data. The covariance matrix is not the expected correlation of your model parameters, but it's the, it's the correlation, and I'm sorry about that, that was here there should be a D, like it is here, right? CD, here should also be CD. I just did copy and paste here a bit too quickly. So you see it's the same form, and most inversions, essentially all inversions, almost, in deterministic framework that Fred Guillaume will talk about, will make those underlying assumptions. And when you read the Bayesian literature, they will say, we can do anything, but in the end, let's just for simplicity assume it's Gaussian. So it's a very common uh, uh, setup, even in the statistics literature. So uh, we go back to this sort of general uh, multivariate Gaussian. Uh, things are correlated, but very often, especially for data errors, people will assume uh, we don't know anything about correlation, so we're just going to forget about it. So here you get essentially the terms either for the multi-Gaussian case where parameters or data errors are uncorrelated or for the exponential case um, when they're uncorrelated. So this is the more, let's say, robust inversion when you're less sensitive to outliers. When you have a linear problem, if you assume Gaussian likelihood and a Gaussian prior, you have an analytical solution for your mean field and your uncertainty, your posterior covariance matrix. So you just type this in whatever uh, coding language you're using and you solve the problem. You know what is the value and what is basically your uncertainty. And of course there's a link here to things like Krieging and so on, even if we're not going to dwell on this in, in detail. Uh, when we are in a nonlinear world, uh, and if we want to be sure that we're going to get to the, the, to the right results eventually, the safest bet is basically the Monte Carlo method or the rejection sampling method. And let's just think about what that is in a very simple case. Assume that you want to know in two dimensions the area of this little thing that I made here. So what is that area? How could I estimate it? A very simple way would be to say, let's uniformly draw a value between 0 and 1 and another value between 0 and 1. So I take a value, another value, and I go around here randomly. I do this 1,000 times, 10,000 times, I don't know, a certain number of times. And I look, how many times did I hit this object and how many times did I not hit it? So let's say I hit it 300 times out of 1,000 uh, tests. So I know that my area is 0.3. So very simple method. Now, when we go to, uh, this would be a case where all of those realizations here of my model parameters are equal and likely. That's not what we're going to do uh, in a normal setting. So if we look now in one dimension, what we will do, we have a prior distribution, so some sort of Gaussian here, on a given model parameter one. We have the likelihood, so a measure of how well we are fitting the data, and we're going to get the posterior distribution somewhere between, because we want to merge these two pieces of information. How do we get this? By rejection sampling. Repeatedly, we draw a value proportional to the, um, uh, to, to the prior. So let's take, a, I, I, by chance, I take this value. Okay? Then I will accept this proposal with a probability that is given by my likelihood. So my likelihood is here. Uh, my likelihood, that is really tiny, divided by my maximal uh, likelihood. So the largest likelihood that you would expect, we call it the supremum. Uh, and it's gonna, not really going to be accepted, right? It's going to have a very small chance of it being accepted because maybe the probability of this point is 10 to the minus 5. So it will only be 1 in 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the 4. So if I do 100,000 times this point, one time I will accept it. If I by chance go here, I will be in a more likely region. So maybe I will accept it now one time out of four. Uh, 
And by chance, here on my prior, I go here. It was unlikely in my prior, very likely in my likelihood. If I go here, I will always accept. So I will keep track of what I'm accepting. I sum it up, and this is my estimation here of my posterior distribution. Okay? So this is a very general approach. Problem, of course, is that we will see this later. It has some limitations. But let's just see how it could work. This is uh, uh, Caroline Dawn, who was a PhD student with my, of mine, and we were looking on conditioning of discrete fracture networks. So we had some prior models. We th thought we knew how many fractures that were needed, something about their ge geostatistical properties. We were simulating these fractures, and then we were conditioning to dif different types of data that were not so constraining. So data type one was, for example, that saline tracer should arrive first in a given fracture when we did a test compared to another one. Uh, we should have a, you know, another different type of things here where we used uh, borehole data, dynamic GPR data, and other things. So basically, you suggest something. Do I accept it based on this criteria? If yes, I go to the next data set. I go to the next. And if I go yes, 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 oh, I got one realization for my posterior. I repeat this, let's say, one million times. I maybe get 200 draws that are fully OK. And those is now my estimation of my uh, posterior. And here's just one realization to just show that Rather, complex models can be created. This is a connected DFN model at the Plumer site, where different fractures, we have inferred their sizes, their ones, uh, we can say something about their connectivity, and we obtain some 200 or so such models. So it's a method that can work, but uh, in many cases it doesn't work. There is something called, we call it the curse of dimensionality. The curse of dimensionality basically says that if I have a problem like this. So I have a region here. This is my region of high likelihood. And let's say that this is between, you know, 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. And this value is 1. That's the maximum value. So if I just in one dimension, I do this sort of moving around, you know, 1 out of five hits will be in this region. So if I do 1,000 times, I have 200 hits, and I can estimate this quite well. Now, imagine now that I go to 100 dimensions, my possibility to find one draw in the area of interest is 0 0.2 to the power of 100. So that's 10 to the power of minus 70. I need to do 10 to the power of 70 draws in high dimensions to get one realization for my posterior. And obviously, it's not going to happen, right? You're never going to do that. So you can, you, at some point, with the rejection sampling, if the posterior is very different than the prior from which you're drawing, it will essentially break down when you go to dimensions larger than 5, 10 or so unknowns. So what you need to do then, or at least what most people do, is that they approach this by doing markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, markov chain Monte Carlo is something that was developed in the, um, in the US during the Second World War for, for developing the, the, the atomic bomb. Uh, basically, what you do here is a bit different. In the rejection sampling, you draw from the prior and you accept proportionally to the likelihood. Now, in the MCMC, uh, framework, what you try to do is that you try to make a guided search in the model space where you're walking proportionally to the posterior distribution. So if you think that you walk, walk in, the, in the mountains and the regions of high probability are the mountaintops, you're spending proportionally more time at the mountaintops than in the valley. And basically, if, if between the valley and the mountaintop, I'm going to spend half the time compared to the time that I spend above. So basically here, I want to be moving around proportionally to this posterior distribution. I'm going to move in my chain. I'm going to save all these different realizations. And then when I've been doing this for a long time enough, I have a good description of my posterior distribution. So how does it work? Basically, you, you make a draw from your prior. Then you have a proposal distribution that will take you from a current model to a new realization, mprop. prop 
uh, and then you're going to evaluate if this new step is going to be accepted and you're going to do that by looking on the likelihood ratio, the proposed model over the current, the, pr the prior probability of the proposed over the current, and if you use a asymmetric proposal distribution, there's also something related here to the proposal distribution. If you use what most people do, a symmetric proposal, you have the metropolis algorithm, so then it's just the likelihood times the prior uh, of the proposed over the current. So basically, what it would mean is that if I'm here, I'm somewhere here in my, uh, uh, in my region and I propose a step to this region here. I'm always going to accept that move. If I'm here and I'm proposed to go down, I will accept it one time out of two in order to ensure that here this has the 50% of the probability of this one. So this is basically what you do, but you do this in, in high dimensions. And there are a few things we need to be careful about. You can look on this slide uh, afterwards if you're interested. What I just want to say is that if you want to do Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, for your problems, you need to make a little numerical trick here to work with log likelihoods. It's just a, a reformulation of the problem to avoid the fact that typically a double precision number in MATLAB, for example, is, is around 10 to the power of minus 300. Your likelihoods might be much smaller so if you work with the log likelihood, you can, you can look on that if you're, if you're reaching this problem. Uh, this has a little trick to avoid this, and this is what everyone does, but it's not always written in, in papers. So when you move around, so I'm somewhere in my space, uh, and I take a step. Am I going to accept this step or not? This is going to be dependent on uh, this uh, ratio. If I am located here in a region of high probability and I'm going to make really large steps so I go from here to here I'm never going to accept that step, right? Because I'm going from a probability that is really high to a probability that is almost non-existent. So in order to accept something I need to have a step here. I go from this point maybe just to a point here. And let's say I'm going to accept this with a probability of 80%. And then I go there. But then, of course, if I do this, I'd be just doing small little steps. So the tricky thing here when you do MCMC is that you need to tune your proposal distribution that you don't make too big steps because you're not going to accept anything, you're just going to stay where you are, or that you make steps that are too tiny because you're just not really moving. So classically speaking, you want to have one out of typically fourth of the proposals that you're proposing should be resulting in an acceptance where you essentially move and you not just stay where you are and just uh, add a realization of the place where you're standing. Uh, there's also the question of burn-in. So when you start, you start somewhere in the prior. Maybe I'm starting here. This is not a very representative value of my posterior distribution. The posterior probability is really, really tiny. So what you will do is that you will look on your posterior probability and you will wait until it starts to oscillate in a sort of stationary type of fashion and then you say, okay, I remove this part, I call it the burn-in, it's the time it needs to go from this random place in the prior space to your model parameters that, you're, uh, that are describing your posterior. From that point, you start to sample, you start to sample the parameters of interest and then you continue your MCMC chain for thousand steps, a million steps, it depends on the problem that you're considering. So how long should you step? Well, you cannot just say we reached burn-in and then we did 10,000 steps and we are fine. This is our posterior distribution. What you need to do is that you need to do this formally. And for example, Gelman and Rubin uh, has a measure of this. So for each model parameter, you run multiple chains, you compare the properties of those chains and you try to say with a reasonable uh, you know, without cheating too much, we can essentially say that the different chains are sampling the same distribution and we can say that we've been running this long enough. And if you look on the lower plot here, uh, here is our root mean square error. So this is essentially when we start fitting the data. Here we're starting to fit the data, so we are locating our posterior. And then we move around 
in some random fashion, and you see those values here, this Gelman-Rubin, that should be below 1.2 on all our parameters. Here's a few hundred of parameters. You need to do many, many more steps. So here we are at around 300,000 or so forward simulations before we can say that we have not just located a, a draw from this posterior, but we have enough samples from this posterior to actually uh, say something about this distribution. Sometimes you don't get there. Uh, so sometimes you just have a problem. Um, and that's mainly in the case when the likelihood surface is extremely um, uh, nonlinear and where you see essential almost um, discontinuities in the likelihood function. So if you would take a case where you have uh, a matrix that is very low probability, channels are very high probability, and you need to, sh the, the channel configuration that you have is sort of reasonable in fitting the data, but it's not great. It's going to be very difficult to, to provide a new distribution of these channels that will fit the data better without going through a, a place, a location, where your probability is really low. So in theory, for infinitely long chains, if your posterior distribution looks like this, so you have sort of two modes here, uh, this is a likely region, this is another likely region. MCMC, theoretically speaking, can move around between these different modes. But in practice, given the number of, of steps you can take, it's often very difficult, especially when you have a lot of data with uh, quite some information. So what you sometimes just have to do is to more run it as a global optimizer or a, or a sampler. So you run for some steps until you find a model that fits the data. Then you restart, you restart, and you say, okay, at least I have five models here that could be in agreement with my, uh, with my data. Uh, when I do my steps here, right, I'm, if I'm going to explore this, uh, this room and I make these tiny steps, the, if I was here, or if I was here, if I was here, it's almost the same information. There's correlation here in my, in my chain. So the number of uh, uncorrelated draws I'm going to have from my posterior is going to be much less than the number of steps I have in my MCMC chain. So you need to calculate this correlation. Here's just a very simple example. Maybe you need something like 30 draws in order to be uncorrelated. So it will just be one draw out of 30 that is providing you information. And in many cases, if you work with multi-Gaussian fields, with many of the classical approaches, this can be like 10,000 steps, 100,000 steps. And this is, of course, one of the issues with uh, these type of techniques. So you have the feeling that you explore things widely, but you actually have a tendency to have a lot of correlation in these chains. Uh, in order to get a reasonable acceptance rate, it comes at the cost of high correlation, and you're not necessarily exploring very well. So how do you improve your exploration? Well, you use fancy techniques. There are many fancy techniques, and I'm not going to mention them. One of them that I just think is nice is parallel tempering. Parallel tempering, what it does, it, is, it tries to run multiple chains with different temperature. And what a high temperature does is that it decreases the value of fitting the data. So you will essentially move around according to your prior distribution. So if you're just moving around in your prior space without having to fit the data, you might, this chain with a temperature of 10, might end up in a region that is interesting, and there's a chance now for the chain, which is the normal chain, the one with temperature of 1, this is the normal MCMC, that it will swap with the temperature 10 degrees. So there's a whole framework here of being able to swap between different chains and temperatures. So you can use essentially those sort of uh, scouts of, of high temperature moving around like crazy, and then you are more conservative, but then sometimes they say, oh, they, here's a really good region, and if you're lucky, you will, even if you're just looking around here, you will jump into this region. Yes? Can you explain the, the idea of temperature? So, so here you see that for a given temperature, the likelihood here uh, is uh, to the power of 1 over t. So what you will essentially do, um, if this is my likelihood indicated here, if I add my temperature, what I essentially will do is that I will flatten my likelihood. And that will make it much easier to go uphill to accept a, a proposal that is less likely in order to go into another region where another mode allows me to fit the data. Because if you have a lot of data, 
it's going to be very difficult, even if theoretically speaking, you can go uphill with MCMC. If you have 1,000 data, it's not very easy. So MCMC. Physical temperature, that's your conclusion. No, yeah. It has nothing to do with physical temperature. No, no. Simulated yeah, so exactly. Which is an equivalence to yeah, exactly. So, so, so these ideas come a bit from so simulated annealing is a global optimization method where you start at a low temperature and you slowly decrease this temperature. And if you do this slowly enough, you will reach the global minimum. So it's, it's, it's sort of a development of, of this type of, um, of ideas. So when you do MCMC, there are a number of conditions here. So I'm not going to mention them here. I will just state them to keep in mind that you cannot just develop your own MCMC code by just doing something, you know, nice and funny and it seems to work. There are a number of conditions here related to ergodicity and detail balance that needs to be fulfilled to be a valid MCMC algorithm. So it's not, let's say, it's not for everyone to develop a new, totally new MCMC technique. It's really what is done by statisticians. statisticians and we often, as geophysicists, we often tend to use uh, codes developed by by other people. So there are some details here about this for those that are interested. Talking now about the prior, uh, so I've been more and more working and been very much influenced by, by Jeff Kerr and Philippe Renard, who's been working in the field of multipoint statistics, where the idea is, could we, instead of creating geophysical images or hydrological images that are just sort of blue and red blobs that sort of float around in space, can we get models that look more like geology? Let's say can we obtain geophysical tomograms that look like this without having data that really allow us to infer this? So we will have geological concepts, a prior, combine it with the data and try to say something more uh, about how the subsurface might look like. So how do we do this? Uh, we do this typically uh, by using uh, essentially an idea by Mosegod and Tarantola. Normally today we call it extended metropolis. What you basically do is that you, you, you sample, you do what's called GIB sampling. GIB sampling is conditional simulations. So you have a starting model here. You will remove these values, you blank them, and then you will re-simulate from your prior, you use a geostatistical code to re-simulate conditionally to all the known values. And you're gonna create a new uh, variation here of this little channel. And then randomly you go to another place. And so this is how you move around in space. So you do this sort of, some sort of Gibbs sampling. So you move in the prior space and then you just accept uh, proportionally to the likelihood ratio. So if we do this, uh, we can see here, for example, the work of Thomas Meyer Hansen. This is old work on simulations today are more nice. But here are just realizations of the prior, uncorrelated field, some sort of multi-Gaussian field, some sort of channelized field. Uh, the data, the true data from this experiment, this was some cross hole data from here to here, and I think this type of model was the correct one. But using these different priors, doing the inversion, assuming that this was reality, this was a good prior, this was a good prior, this was a good prior, with a lot of data and high quality, here are our posterior realizations. Okay? So we've used all this data, and the images are vastly different. They all fit the data. These uncorrelated images, they will still allow you to fit the data because there is an average, if I would average over all those realizations, thousands of them, I would obtain something very similar to normal geophysical tomogram or what you would obtain by Krieging. Uh, so basically the prior, what you put into your spatial prior has a huge influence on your posterior distribution. So if you don't put time in thinking about it, you're essentially uh, you know, even if you find a model that fits your data, it's just part of the story. Your prior has to also be meaningful. So how do we approach it now? We've been using what's called graph cuts. It's related to image kilting. The group of Jeff Karras has been working on this. Basically, the idea is a little bit different. You have an image, we call it a training image, that describes how the geology might look like. We take a piece of this training image and we have a starting model. So this is my starting model. I randomly go in my training image, I take a piece, I overlay the two, and then I look on how different are they. And then there's a fast, fancy algorithm 
that will define an optimal cut uh, that will essentially allow us to take a piece from the, from the training image, put it here and still honor more or less uh, the higher order statistics. So you're still getting realizations that look like geology. And here is just some recent uh, results of this where we've been applying this to some tracer experiments at the MAID site in the US. So the mean values here are not so useful, but let's you look on the most likely model, so the maximum a posterior model here. This is a multi-Gaussian field. This is what we obtained by our MCMC inversion as the most likely model. Here is something based on some outcrop data. This is from a, a, an outcrop in Germany. Here is some lithophases, and here's a hybrid model with some fine channels proposed by Runine and, and Gorelick. And you see, they are not fitting the data exactly to the same level, but at a similar level, there are some similarities. So basically, you have a region here of high probability, sort of high probability, sort of high probability, high and high. But the details is dependent on your prior model. So the, how to define good spatial priors is, to me, an open question. What we've also been doing uh, is to jump a little bit on this bandwagon now of deep learning, um, where you can use training images and train uh, um, a, a neural network uh, of such that you can create realizations that look like these images uh, by just drawing from uncorrelated um, uh, normal Gaussians. So the idea is basically that you look on many images you define some parameters here that are just, let's say, 25 variables, Gaussian distributed, and when I draw from those, I will get realizations that look like my complex geology. Um, there are other people working on this, so there's a student of Martin Blunt. Uh, Mosser has a number of papers on the archive on this, nothing published, I think, but it's on its way, I guess. Uh, so here is what we can get on this. So here are images that look like geostatistical simulations, but they are obtained by drawing in this uh, lower dimensional space uh, random Gaussian, uncorrelated random Gaussians. And the output, when you run through this through the neural network, will look, this is our training image that we train on, and realizations look similar. Or here is some channels, this is the training image, and here's the realizations. And now if you want to do inversion, it's much better because you can do inversion on these parameters, they are Gaussian, they are uncorrelated, so you can run things that are more efficient, efficient than extended uh, metropolis. You can use much more advanced MCMC codes. So it can be nice. In geophysics, we have some problems. Uh, our problems are that we already mentioned. Uh, geophysics becomes essentially a nuisance variable. We're not interested in electrical connectivity. We're interested in something else some structure or some state variable. Well, let's say, let's say we're interested in probability. So uh, this we can call lithological tomography. Miguel Bosch uh, has worked a lot on this. Uh, so you essentially have a prior that describes your probability structure, multi-Gaussian model or something more fancy. You have a pedrophysical model that relates your geophysical properties to this structure. And then you have likelihoods that use the hydrological data to constrain the geophysical structure, the, 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 sorry, the hydrologic structure and the geophysical data that can constrain the geophysical structure. And we can solve this with MCMC here, for example, where we account for errors in the pedrophysical properties. So what we are inferring for is a porosity field from GPR data, where we also uh, allow for the fact that our Pedrophysical relationship is imperfect and it has spatial correlation. And we try to infer for the pedrophysical uncertainty. So these are realizations of pedrophysical uncertainty. So essentially the deviation between predictions and observed data in space. Uh, and when we do this, we can avoid bias. So the cases that are consistent here is the case where we have pedrophysical uncertainty and we account for this pedrophysical uncertainty. If we, uh, if we do not have uh, if you do not account for pedrophysical uncertainty, our estimates will be biased. So this is one thing, I think, in hydrogeophysics that maybe has not received so much attention, the, the need to essentially account for the scatter in pedrophysical relationships when you do sort of integrated inversion.
Um, yeah, I'm, I, I guess the only thing I want to say here, because I'm running short of time, is to say that <clears throat> when you have petrophysical errors, you would maybe like to say that I, I don't really need to estimate what is the probability of my geophysical data. So I can say, you know, what is the posterior of permeability given the geophysics? And I can say this is my prior on permeability times the likelihood of permeability given the geophysical data. So you would say this, this is what you would do. Why? Because uh, you would expect this likelihood here to be much less informative, so much wider, because the petrophysical uncertainty will sort of inflate this likelihood and make it less, um, uh, the information would be less. But that's only straightforward for linear physics, for linear problems. Otherwise, this likelihood is what's called intractable. You cannot, you cannot solve it um, uh, in a simple way. So there's a number of more or less fancy uh, approaches in statistics to deal with this intractable uh, likelihoods, and this is a bit what we are working on now, to, to sort of be more efficient in doing this type of inversions without having to go through an inference of uh, a geophysical field um, as we have to do here. We have to infer for the pedrophysical uncertainty instead of just accounting for the effect of the pedrophysical uncertainty. Similarly here, another challenge uh, which is totally open and is totally open in the statistics literature as well, is model errors, so our physical modeling is not perfe perfect. So physics is simplified. I think almost all everything we do in the physics is simplified. We are discretizing. We use some numeric. We have some numerical errors. We have boundary effects and so on. Uh, a lot of work has been done in statistics on this, but it works well for sort of idealized situations in low dimensions. So here's a simple and nice example. There's a machine here. Effort versus work, and you say that, okay, if I put in effort 4, I get work 3 out, if I put effort 2, I get work 1.5 out. But then this machine is not perfect, so there's some friction or loss, so when I put a lot of effort, I get less out than I would get, uh, proportionally speaking. So the machine is getting less efficient. So if this is my true model, but I assume this model, what can I do? And this is just an example of this sort of issue with model errors. If I just gather a lot of data, so this is different numbers of data, 11, 31, and 61 data,